That question came from um, Jackie Cordero from Val Valley Water. Okay. All right, we'll get back to Jackie. All right, any raised hands, Michael? <laughs> I am not seeing any yet. Any questions? I mean, if you have, you can, you don't have to type it in the chat if you have a question, you can speak it out, but we just like to see your raised hand so we can control um, the conversation. Well, that's it, get on the bus, let's get rolling. We're right on time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Well, we're ready to get back on the bus. Make sure everybody's um, accounted for and not in the restroom. <laughs> um, but um, uh, so we'll move forward. So we have with us from Silicon uh, Valley Clean Water, Anir Bagwat, who's the senior engineer, and Arvin Akila, who's an engineer direct, engineering director. And I'll turn it over to Anir and Arvin. Thanks, Robert. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hopefully uh, you had a wonderful tour of the Bay. I know we started off in uh, Petrel Sassoon this morning and we you know, drove up north to Roseville, came down <laughs> south again, <laughs> crossed the, you know, to Hayward. And now here we uh, you know, cross, take the bridge across to San Mateo and uh, you know, we're in the Mid Peninsula. And you know, we're very excited to have you here and host you virtually at the Silicon Valley Clean Water Plant. Um, uh, you know, the excellent presentations by Jordan and Ben, uh, Marisa and Bert, and, uh, you know, just uh, following up on that, hopefully you guys are still awake uh, with, you know, the coffee is <laughs> not kicked out yet. <laughs> but nonetheless, yeah. you know, excellent presentation. So it would be a hard act to follow, but nonetheless, you know, we're here. Uh, we're very excited to showcase one of our innovative projects here, which is right behind me, by the way. Uh, it's all virtual. I'm not standing <laughs> in the front, but that's our energy storage system that we're going to talk about today. Uh, you know, along with me, I have Urban Dakela. As I said, he's the engineering director, and actually, he's the one who's mostly implemented the project. So he's going to be supporting me and answering the questions as they come up. Uh, but let's get started. Let me share my screen here. Can you guys see it? Okay. Yes, we can. All right. Sounds good. So. Uh, you know, we, we're going to talk about the energy storage system for power demand management here. Uh, let's me, let me give you a little bit of an outline of what we're going to talk about. So we first, uh, you know, many of us uh, are new to Silicon Valley Clean Water. So let me, you know, uh, walk through what, who we are and what we do, followed by uh, some description of the project at hand, the energy storage system. Uh, we'll go through the project features, the scope, schedule, budget, uh, and then mostly talk about the benefits that we are going to accrue out of this one. And then uh, finally talk about some of the lessons learned and the challenges we faced. And then of course, you know, uh, take any questions as they come up. So uh, let's begin with uh, who we are. Uh, so this is a aerial view of our service area. As I said, we are in the mid peninsula region here. The star shows where our plant is located right on the bay uh, in the city of Redwood City. Uh, Silicon Valley Clean Water actually, you know, until 2014 used to be called the South Bayside System Authority. Uh, so some, some of us may know us as SBSA. Uh, since 2014, we have been called Silicon Valley Clean Water, and it's uh, an homage to where, you know, we are located in the heart of Silicon Valley and uh, doing excellent work in providing, running this workhorse uh, for providing water to everything that this Bay Area is known for. So. Uh, you know, I think that is an appropriate name change. Uh, we are a joint powers authority formed by four jurisdictions, uh, the city of Belmont, the city of San Carlos, uh, city of Redwood City, and then finally the West Bay Sanitary District. Uh, uh, those four formed together, uh, came together and formed the uh, Silicon Valley Clean Water. Uh, we are, uh, you know, serving about 220,000 people here. Uh, you know, we I have about nine miles of force main uh, that's shown on the blue line on the map. Uh, we have about five pump stations and then uh, the advanced wastewater treatment plant right at the edge of the bay. Uh, you know, it's, uh, let me, I think, uh, here are some key figures that talk about it. Uh, so as I said, 220,000 customers. Uh, we are an organization of 85 employees. Uh, 
led by uh, Teresa Herrera, our manager. Uh, I think she's on the call, so here's a shout out to her. <laughs> Um, I do also see a lot of others uh, here. I think I see Cara there and uh, Sylvia was there earlier. So again, shout out to all our Silicon Valley folks out there. Uh, we talked about you know having four pump stations and more than nine miles of force main and the advanced wastewater treatment facility. Uh, the, the facility itself uh, is a uh, size for 29 million gallons a day of average dry weather flow, while we can handle a peak of up to 71 MGD. We also uh, provide uh, recycled water, about 750 acre feet per year, to the city of Redwood City. So we don't necessarily supply it directly, but we provide it to Redwood City, who then sends it on to uh, commercial uh, uh, consumers like uh, Oracle and uh, Electronic Arts and a bunch of other uh, organizations uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, Similar to uh, uh, Marisha, I think she mentioned that the city of Hayward is a, uh, has been recognized as a utility of the future. We have been recently recognized as a, in the 2020 as the utility of the future uh, at the WEFTEC conference a few weeks ago, maybe, uh, for our uh, energy generation and recovery system. So I think this is uh, good timing. You know, we just uh, are going to talk about the same, one of the main components of why we were recognized as the utility of the future. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we can walk through the treatment plant as such. I, I, unfortunately, I don't have a, uh, as good as a video as Bird did, but uh, hopefully I can you know, walk through our schematic and uh, uh, you know, we can talk about some of the things we're gonna talk about. So on the right-hand side of the picture, uh, you'll see you know, we are, uh, that's the, the liquid train and the left-hand side is the solid strain. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that we don't have a headwork system in place as of yet. You know, we've been uh, taking in pri through primary sedimentation and then we go straight to our uh, biological treatment, which is a trickling filter system followed by an activated sludge system. Uh, but, you know, pretty soon we are in the process of implementation of a major program to uh, put in uh, what we call the front of plant, including a headwork system. So that's being constructed right now and is uh, soon to be operational, maybe in the next year or so. So that's an exciting project for us. Uh, one of the biggest projects that we have done in the recent memory. And we are also upgrading our uh, force main system uh, as part of the same program. Uh, so yeah, exciting things uh, coming up in the future. Uh, but nonetheless, in the present, we have, you know, as I said, the biological treatment uh, followed by our uh, dual media, media filters. Uh, then we go into disinfection by chlorine followed by uh, dechlorination. And then we have an out outfall going into the bay. On the uh, solid side, uh, we have about, you know, our uh, sludge, uh, the waste activated and the thickened and the primary sludge go into our digesters. Uh, we also take in uh, white soils, grease from our local neighborhoods uh, to co digest in our digesters. Uh, you know, the solids finally, you know, once they're digested, they send out, go through a dewatering process, and we have drying beds in parallel. So uh, finally, everything goes uh, is hauled away as biosolids uh, to mostly composting and then uh, agriculture reuse. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty full plant there. Uh, one thing I would definitely want to bring up is, uh, and we are very proud of that, is the cogeneration system that we have. Uh, you know, the, the gas that's produced from the bioga uh, biogas and the digesters, we do cogenerate that. And uh, definitely, you know, it's, uh, it's one of the big components of our energy neutrality goal. Uh, that uh, I'm going to show you uh, in a few slides uh, what it does for us, but uh, definitely something that's very, very proud of. Um, so uh, this is the plant aerial as you zoom in and uh, the takeaway here is that, you know, this is right on the bay. It's a very beautiful site, but it's also a very compact treatment plant. Uh, you know, we are uh, all the facilities that we just uh, walked through, you know, they are located in this more or less this footprint here. Uh, uh, we have uh, locations where we have structures on top of each other, uh, including like the chlorine contact tanks are, you know, right below our fixed film uh, trickling filters. So uh, same thing on the primary clarifiers, you know, our, uh, uh, admin building sits right on top of our primary clarifier. So it's a very unique uh, facility. Usually I've seen plants more spread out, but uh, you know, we, uh, it's, it's surprising how uh, when we want to build things in a smaller footprint, we can still achieve so many uh, wonders in, in one sense. So that's, that's where we are located. Uh, I wish we could actually walk through the plant today, but uh, we'll have to do that another time. 
So I did talk about our code generation system earlier. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we are especially proud of this. It's about uh, 1.25 megawatts of uh, engine capacity. We, these are recently installed in 2015. These are two uh, Genbacher engines uh, with our uh, new gas blending system and treatment system. And we also do uh, waste heat recovery. Uh, this uh, waste heat that we recover powers the entire plant heat demand, including the heating of our digesters, the building heating. So you know, we have the capacity to capability to uh, take in natural gas from PG&E, but uh, our goal is to take you know, heat uh, the plant entire, in its entirety by itself. The other great thing that uh, you know, we do as part of the co-generation system is we generate up to 65% of our uh, net power demand. Uh, you know, we, this, this graph here shows, you know, we're taking about 35% from PG&E and uh, 65%. And this is, uh, our goal is to try to increase that to uh, get to 100% in the future if possible. Uh, why are we doing that? Uh, you know, as there's, the simplest answer would be, you know, just looking at the cost of purchase power at 22 cents a kilowatt hour if you buy from PG&E versus if we generate it ourselves, you know, we, we, we can generate it at seven cents per kilowatt hour. So just from pure uh, fiscal basis, we can generate about a million dollars or more in annual savings just by generating it ourselves. Uh, this does not account for the heat demand, which is an additional bonus. So uh, uh, co-generation definitely makes fiscal sense, but trying to go energy neutral is, is our future goal on this plant here. Um, and you know, this is a figure that all of you have seen as you know, all the treatment plants as we're going through. This is how power, the cost of power keeps on increasing. You know, this is just a snapshot from 20, 2005 all the way to the 2015. And it's just going up. Uh, even beginning 2021, March 21, we are going through another rate change with PG&E. You know, um, the dynamics are changing and the cost of power is increasing. So you know, the benefits, you know, we talked about a million dollars in power savings last year is going to just go keep on going up. It's, uh, it's going to get better. So the more we are self-reliant, the better it is for us and our ratepayers, and also for the environment. I mean, you know, we are sort of generating biogas uh, as part of our uh, wastewater treatment. And then if we can reuse that to, you know, uh, not take an energy, that just is the best thing to do. So overall, it makes perfect sense. And you know, with that overall goal of trying to be energy neutral, we have as a, as a facility done a lot of work over the past 10 years or so. Uh, I'm just sort of highlighting some things, including you know, back in 2011, we upgraded our digester mixing system. Uh, back in 2015, we put in two new cogen engines that we just showed you. Uh, we also uh, upgraded our fog receiving station. Uh, we were one of the first few in the Bay Area to put in a fog co-digestion system back in the early 90s, I believe. So uh, that needed some upgrades. So we did that in 2017 and it has helped uh, boost the gas production we get from our digesters. We also evaluated you know, solar photovoltaic cells back in 2019. Uh, it just did not pan out because you know, we are, the cost of construction of that grid and that array on um, you know piles was pretty expensive but we continue to look at other opportunities to uh, become more energy neutral uh, we uh, including you know we are looking at the food waste co-digestion effort right now i mean uh, that's that's one of the uh, things that we are looking at to boost biogas but today uh, we're going to talk about the energy storage system which is the battery that uh, it's also called the tesla battery which is right behind me here uh, and uh, that's recently been implemented. It's, it's almost been commissioned as I uh, speak. So uh, that's something that we are very proud of and would like to show you. It is fairly new. It's, I've never seen it. I, I know there's a, usually commercial installations of this, uh, but not typically in treatment plants. I, I know there's a couple of installations, maybe in Southern California and Irvine and maybe Inland Empire. But uh, again, you know, this is pretty new and this is pretty exciting. So here we are, we'll, let's talk about the energy storage system here. So, you know, to begin with, let's just go through why we want to do this. And uh, to do that, let's look at the anatomy of our typical summer electric bill from PG&E. Um, you know, many of you have seen this. Uh, if you haven't, you know, definitely you get a similar bill for your homes. Uh, now it's a bit different at a treatment plant because uh, there's a more 
line items here, it's, first of all, the dollar value is much higher. <laughs> then the second thing is, there's a few more line items here. So I just wanted to walk you through uh, what we pay for when we pay a, a typical electric bill. So the first thing you see is the customer connection charge. Uh, that's just the cost of being connected to the grid. That's just a, a dollar per day. Uh, you know, you're, you're taking power that day, you pay for that day. There's that. Uh, the next one is the demand charge. That is the cost of power. You know, you were drawing power from the grid. So that's the cost of a dollar per kilowatts. The next one is the cost of energy usage. You know, you're drawing uh, energy from this at a dollar per kilowatt hour. So that's that's what you're paying for. And then finally, there's these flat charges and taxes that you pay, which are just you know, straightforward. So overall, you can see the summer bill of 75,000 more than 50% of it is coming from this demand charge component. And that is, I'll explain to you what that is, but that's that's a big deal. So, you know, one thing we figured that if we want to save our operating costs, we have to cut down on that demand charge number. And why is it more than half of it? Uh, let's uh, go through that. Uh, so this is, you know, uh, the current uh, e pg and &E tariff that we are charged on. Some of you may know this. Uh, others may also know that beginning March 2021, this is being replaced by a new uh, tariff called V20. But nonetheless, you know, for purposes of discussion, this highlights what we do. So as you can see in the summer season, which is from May to October, pg and &E sort of puts in uh, hours and classifies hours. So between noon and 6 p.m., these are called the peak hours. And, uh, you know, the the use you have during this peak period, you are billed at a very high dollar per kilowatt, which is about $22.77. So this is in addition to what you would anyway pay for the maximum. So it's a double whammy of sorts. You know, you would pay for the maximum demand. And then you would also, if, it, if the demand coincides with the max peak during the peak hours, you would pay an additional $22.77 on top of that. So, you know, this is like $40 a kilowatt during the peak period. And this is where we see the most benefit if we could somehow reduce this. And that's one of the reasons why we figured why not do an energy storage system. So to understand what that does, you know, we are water people, all of us hopefully understand water, you know, we are in the water business. So I wanted to give an analogy of how the energy system works by talking about how a water system works. So how do we store water in a tank or a, you know, a drinking water system or a reservoir of sorts? Uh, you know, this is a typical curve. Uh, you know, you are, uh, there's a standard uh, you know, period of, uh, the, the water tank system provides a wide spot in the system. So what you do is you know, when your demand is low, you start filling up your tank, which is shown at the, you know, the left-hand side of the uh, figure here. But as your you know, demand starts going up and your flow uh, supply is short, then you start supplementing that supply with your, what you stored in your water tank. So you know, that's when you start into the drawdown phase. So this is very similar what we are going to do on an energy management system. So instead of, you know, uh, saving water here or instead of uh, filling up water, storing water, we are storing energy. And uh, a similar figure for our energy management system would look like this. Um, and so instead of having a water tank uh, to store the water, we are just charging up our batteries and storing energy in it. And this is a typical, you see the green line is a typical uh, load profile. This is how we draw power. Uh, you can see some of the blue in the, in the top figure here. So the idea is that, you know, the power draw is what it is, but if that power draw coincides in a peak period, that's when your battery gets smart about it and figures, okay, if I have, if I can charge during the off peak periods, and then I can discharge and, you know, supply power back to the grid. So you don't, so pg &E doesn't see that demand. It's supplied by your batteries during the peak periods, uh, which is shown in this valleys in the, so the green green figure is essentially the battery system uh, taking over and you know the, the blues that are sticking out are essentially, where that's when the battery is uh, providing the power. So you, the, you don't see the peak 
the PGE doesn't see the peak demand get hit at that point. The the figure at the bottom is essentially how the battery charges up and uh, discharges. What you don't see here is you know what is the peak period of usage. But as you can see, you know the battery starts discharging. That's when you know in the lower figure it starts going down. That's when the peak period, the peak pricing is hitting. So as soon as that comes online, the battery is smart enough uh, to understand that, and it starts discharging to avoid you getting you know double the double punch of having a peak demand during the maximum pricing period. So it's pretty cool as such. It's not uh, you know uh, fairly intuitive. It's it's, it's all behind the scenes. Um, it's not a, a mechanical system where you can actually see anything going on. It's it's a it's a smart machine, um, uh, but you know, uh, with the theme of being in the Silicon Valley, I think it's appropriate. <laughs> uh, I can go through the project features. Uh, so what did we end up putting up uh, as a battery system and what does it look like? So typically this is, uh, we, we bought batteries. Uh, these are Tesla batteries, uh, they're called power packs. Uh, we have about 12 power packs, which overall come up to about a megawatt of uh, storage. Uh, it all comes along with an inverter, a transformer, and all the electrical connections to make it work. Um, you also have to have a, a programming. You know, it, it, this is a very smart system. It, it uses machine learning and smart algorithms to uh, work it. It's not something that we, uh, you know, have to monitor manually. It's all uh, programmed in with the intent of, you know, uh, monitoring it every millisecond. It monitors it at milliseconds and sees if the demand is going up and that coincides with say the peak pricing, then it will start discharging automatically. So it, it's a pretty smart system. Uh, we also have a maintenance contract with our uh, uh, provider so that you know there, whatever is needed for these batteries, they can provide. Um, and of course the programming, you know, because whenever, whenever there's a rate change by PG&E, we have to program in the new tariffs in the system. So that's again provided by our maintenance contract. And this is what it looks like. You know, it's right behind me too, but there's another picture here. Uh, this also sort of shows, so you can see those uh, boxes on the left-hand side. These are the 12 power packs. Uh, in, the, in the middle, there's, whenever it says Tesla, that's the inverter system. It's also uh, next to that is the disconnect switches, the transformer. And, you know, this is right next to our uh, 12 kV switch gear behind in the background. So it's uh, right, Pretty close to our electrical system, so the you know it can seamlessly interconnect with our uh, electrical system at the plant. This is what a typical power pack looks like. Uh, it's about you know uh, it's about 60 inches tall and uh, about 86 inches tall, so uh, it weighs quite a lot. But you know again, you know, as such, they're just sitting there and. Uh, they can charge over time. Uh, there's an array of them, uh, these power packs right next to each other, as you saw in the picture. And even though it says Tesla, you know, these were supplied by, uh, we not purchased directly with Tesla, these were purchased through another uh, contractor, but uh, that contractor provides sort of a single point solution to not only construct it, but design it and, you know, procure the uh, technology from Tesla. I did mention earlier the smart algorithms and machine learning. I mean, this is all about data. You know, we are in the time of big data. And this is, you know, we have interfaces provided by our um, uh, maintenance contractor and the programming guys that monitors how this, how our load curve looks like at any given point of time. It also monitors, you know, when the pricing comes uh, off peak and uh, on peak. So the system is, being very smart. It also learns over time how you are operating this. You know, how does the plant come if the cogen engines kick on? You know, some, there's a different profile. So there's a lot of things going on at a treatment plant which can change things. And, you know, this thing gets smarter every time. It, it does trending analysis. And uh, over time, we realize how, how best to operate the system. So, again, you know, fairly hands free, uh, fairly uh, smart. And uh, we look forward to seeing how it performs. You know, I mean, as I said, it's being commissioned and programmed as we speak, but uh, it's, it's a pretty neat system that uh, we will see the benefits uh, for. I have the next few slides, I think talk about, you know, how we delivered the project over the, and then who, who we contracted with. 
So we had a budget of about $2.2 million for this effort, uh, out of which you know, the construction cost was about a million point six. Uh, we were able to get a self-generating uh, incentive uh, program grant for about a million dollars, so that helped out a lot. Yeah, this was designed by uh, AMS, which is Advanced Microgrid Solutions. So they are an EPC engineering procurement uh, contractor, and they worked with the uh, core states group to do the construction. And then uh, finally, the servicing and the programming and the management of this is being provided by a system called a firm called NLX. So that's uh, who is doing the programming of the system right now. Uh, so we talked about, you know, what once we implement this, what are we expecting to see? So you know, the AMS worked with us to come up with a, you know, what they, they analyzed our system, our load profile for the past so many years, and then they, as you can see here in the figure, you know, this was our old global peak. This is, you know, during the peak period, peak pricing period, we get the double whammy on this this figure, this number, and if we can draw that down to uh, to buy even 200. KW, you know, that's that's significant at $40 a kilowatt. That is a big deal. So I think that's what the battery is trying to do is to, you know, charge during the off-peak period and discharge during the peak period. Uh, so overall, we can expect a savings of about $150,000 a year. So, uh, you know, this is, and this gets smarter over time, and that's $150,000 a year today. Now, of course, as the rates go up, this, this savings number keeps on going up. So that's, uh, there's a, a bigger advantage than this $160,000 a year as shown. You know, this, uh, I would like to share what we, what were the barriers and challenges on this project? I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a new technology. It's, uh, we're working with a startup firm which does not have a long track record in business. And if you guys know about wastewater or water, we guys are sort of, not usually at the bleeding edge. We, we would like to see things which are tried, tested, and hopefully, you know, we, as, I, as I say, you know, local installations in the Bay Area. Guess what? There's no local installations in the Bay Area. I'm glad we could find some in, even in California. So uh, it's always a risk. You know, you, you're working with a new technology, but, you know, we, we sort of analyzed the risk and we saw the benefits of it and we figured, you know, this might make a good business case and the business case proved itself. Uh, there was some concern about the viability of the technology, but you know, it's the commercial installations have done this. You know, some buildings have this. Some, uh, they, of course, they are different. You know, wastewater treatment plants are, have cogen engines, and uh, we have a more complicated system. But nonetheless, you know, this, the battery system technology works. It's um, more about you know getting it to work and programming it for a treatment plant, and um, that was the challenge on this one. I think the biggest challenge, and uh, I, I'm sure Arvind would. Uh, uh, and others, uh, I, I believe Jordan mentioned that this morning too, about working with PG&E, you know, uh, you need to coordinate with them a lot, uh, especially with their interconnection group, because, you know, this, in a sense, is tying into their interconnection, interconnection system. So if anything, the takeaway is communicate with them, coordinate with them, be on top of it, because, you know, they, they work on a different schedule. So we have as an agency to sort of make sure that we are on top of things to make it happen. Uh, that did have an impact on the project. Um, I mean, uh, we did uh, have a one year delay due to pg &E. So I guess if anything, the lesson learned is if you are planning to do something like this in the future, or even any interaction with pg &E, <laughs> just put float in your schedule, uh, that will happen. And uh, it's, it's just the nature of the beast, but um, you know, you just have to stay on top of it. I think, as I said, the other case, and I mean, that's true for all projects. It doesn't matter if it was a battery project, was to uh, get early buy-in from O&M and uh, management. I think they were very supportive on this project because the, you know, the business case was proving itself. It was working out. So, uh, you know, this this has a this is a pretty neat technology, and the the, the you know, payback is pretty short as well. And uh, getting a grant also helped out on this project. So. Again, you know, there's a lot of uh, exciting things uh, that we are doing as part of our energy savings and uh, management. And I think this, this is also going to be a big component of that. And we look forward to, we are not seeing many of these installations and uh, I can see it improving itself. And uh, many of our agencies, uh, neighbors would be pretty soon picking up on this. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, 
reach out to us and uh, no, we are always happy to talk about this. Uh, I'll put down the contacts for myself and uh, in Arvind, who's, who's been the champion and uh, on implementing this project. So uh, he has the most direct experience among all of us to talk about this. Uh, so uh, yeah, with that, uh, let me know if you guys have any questions. Uh, Robert, are you with us? Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks for all the great um, presentation, Anir. And there are a few questions here. Here's one. Um, have you had a lot of issues with ragging of pumps due to the fact that you had no headworks? Uh, I'll take the question, Anir. Um, sure. We, we did uh, have a lot of raggings and, uh, and because of that, our pumps were being impacted uh, very often. What we ended up doing is install a, a, a basically screen, uh, DuPron screens uh, in the interim while our main headworks uh, is being built. So that DuPron screens that we installed uh, helped a lot. Uh, it reduced the maintenance hours on our pumps. Uh, but again, there's, the, those were not helping with the grid. Uh, the upcoming project will uh, not only reduce the grid, uh, but also rag, ragging. So we're expecting that the maintenance uh, should be uh, reduced on our OLED pumps. Um, uh, but that Dupron screen helped a little bit, uh, or not a little bit, actually a lot when we installed it. Great. Uh, how excited was PG&E about your Tesla battery project? Very excited. So excited that they delayed us by more than a year. <laughs> and uh, uh, you, you can, as Anir mentioned in the presentation, uh, you're, you're going to face a lot of challenges with the uh, interconnection group. Um, and, and not necessarily because they want to delay. Um, in fact, this project is not just helping us, but it is going to help PG&E. When we reduce that peak uh, during the summer uh, peak hours, it is not just helping us, it is helping the grid. We're taking that peak off of the grid, mm -hmm. which under other programs, PG&E will pay you for if you uh, participate. And we will participate in those demand response programs. But eventually, overall, PG&E is, uh, is going to be helped by this. But the interconnection group is so overwhelmed and probably not well managed at this point that uh, you have to constantly just keep, you know, you know, keep on your, stay on your toes to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do. You have to ask them at every step of the way, did you do this? Did you do that? What are you going to do next? If you don't, they're going to just go and sleep and you will find out or you will realize that they're doing what they're supposed to do. The, the reality is not. I, I cannot say this for entire pg &E, but I, that's why we're being specific about the interconnection group. The other groups we have, we 